military convoy escort my missionary <laughs> to your city. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, Chris, and Nick delve into emergent properties and games. How do they come about, and why do they appeal? Plus, Metroid Samus Returns, Heat Signature, Sidereal Confluence, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 111 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy, y'all. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by the newest official member of the podcast, Nick. Hello. Uh, Nick won't be joining us necessarily for every episode, but he is uh, definitely doing all our music as he has been, and he's uh, also taking over some editing duties uh, on Roll With It, for example. So um, he'll be making some contributions behind the scenes as well. Also, uh, make a wish, because it's going to be a very long time before we have another uh, uh, triple-digit episode like this. Well, oh. not triple digits, but like triple. You get what I mean. We have to wait uh, another 111 episodes until this yeah, happens. Yeah, exactly. It's our 111st birthday. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Or something. Um, in honor of our 111st birthday, we're going to be discussing emergence gameplay. Now, this is something that we've talked a lot about um, in a number of different episodes and a number of different contexts, but today we're going to focus in on it. It's the idea of things that kind of come out of gameplay that maybe the designers didn't um, explicitly intend to happen or things that kind of make your game uh, given playthrough of that game different from anyone else's um it's it gives a lot of great depth a lot of great replayability um it makes for great stories you can tell your friends about like uh, oh yeah when i was playing this this is what happened to me um so it's a really neat element of gameplay and we can talk a little bit about um how you design it in if you design it in at all um so i think it should be an interesting discussion yeah, and to that end, we have absolutely no show notes, so it's going to be completely emergent. Exactly. So, right. <laughs> this, this has been a topic that has just naturally emerged in a lot of our shows, so mm-hmm. now we finally get to just focus on it. Yeah. It, it even emerged just before we started recording, so we mm-hmm. didn't plan on this before we came in. Wow. <laughs> That's Man. how good we are. So the special mad. word for the day is emergent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pee Herman. <laughs> First, we have some opening segments for you, which we did write down, including the button mosh. For the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Hey, so being the uh, the resident uh, hyper Metroid fanboy, um, of course I have to talk a little bit about the newest release, Metroid Samus Returns. Um, Especially because I want to compare it to the other Metroid 2 remake, AM2R, which was an unofficial fan remake that came out last year that I was very excited about as well. It was good. Um, it you was encouraged quite good. me to play it, and it was mm-hmm. fantastic. Um, now, Nintendo takes a different approach, and honestly, I think it's a better approach, and I kind of want to talk a little bit about why. Um, so both games are, essentially, they're, they are remakes of the second Metroid, Metroid 2, Return of Samus, which admittedly is kind of a black sheep, or was considered the black sheep of the Metroid franchise until Other M came out and (laughs) redefined what black sheep could mean for that franchise. Um, But a lot of that was because it was an experimental game because of the Game Boy. They had to do things differently. Um, They had to, essentially, gameplay took place on screens. They couldn't do some of the open scrolling that they had before. Um, It was a little bit more of a guided guided experience um, because you had to defeat Metroids in order to unlock other areas of the map, essentially. So it was a little bit more of a um, gated experience than the original Metroid, or future Metroids were. Um, With AM2R, they carried over that same concept, and of course, the current game does the same thing. Now, the Nintendo version, the 3DS version, um, Samus Returns, T- makes some other changes. So one of the biggest changes that it does in terms then the controls take a little bit of getting used to, but it gives you the ability to free aim your blaster, which is actually pretty neat and is 
actually pretty crucial. 360 degrees, I assume, instead of just the eight directions they typically have? Well, it gives you it's free control. I wouldn't say 360 because you can't, like, go under yourself and around, sort of, but you can... You get pretty a pretty big arc. It's like mm-hmm. a 270 or something okay. like that. Yeah, it's pretty big, um, and you do have a little guiding li- light that kind of helps you understand where it's going. Mm-hmm. So it does have that, which is which is really useful, especially for uh, Metroid battles. But the other new mechanic is you actually have a melee mode, mm-hmm. um, just like a melee strike, kind of an uppercut, and this is really actually meant to counterattack enemies that kind of dive bomb at you, um, and it's actually crucial. There are enemies that will just come straight at you, and if you don't do that, you take damage. And you actually take quite a bit of damage to enemies, so I'm pretty glad mm. that they are not really reducing the difficulty. Um, but the biggest shift between this game and um, AM2R is actually the way that they present the game and the environment that you're in. Metroid, for me, has always been about this isolationist experience. And you're not really... You're not essentially trying to necessarily like kill everything around you it's just you're trying to survive you're in this alien environment everything is dangerous um some things might come after you because it's just natural uh, natural for them to do that but they're animals they're not it's not like you're fighting you know aliens mm-hmm. for, for the most part and that obviously changed in later metroid games but that was what the original was always to me and that had a lot of appeal there and it kind of had was a sort of lonely experience where i'm exploring a space um and the challenge was always about how how deep can you go and still still survive, basically. It wasn't about, I'm going to fight, fight all of these different bosses, which is what the series later became. Um, AM2R actually took after Super Metroid, but also later games like uh, Metroid Fusion that incorporated more boss fights into the Metroid series. And so AM2R had a lot more boss fights. Um, with Metroid Return of Samus, it feels a lot more like a classic Metroid experience. You still have boss encounters, kind of, but those boss encounters are not really bosses. It's just, oh, you've run into another Metroid, and it has these different properties, and you you have to defeat it. It, it can be challenging to beat, but it it doesn't. Fe- it feels more like here's this other creature that you have to stop because this is your main mission, as opposed to here's this super boss. The other thing I find very interesting with it is that the storyline, which has been expanded in this game. Um, actually has a lot of similarities which of course must be coincidental to am2r which mm-hmm. I, I now i realize that that has to be why they wanted they had the cease and desist not mm-hmm. just because it was a because it was actually quite a quite good game um but i think a lot of it had to do with the storyline mm-hmm. and the whole storyline of the um you know elite force that goes down to the planet um sr388 i think um to take down the metroids and you, and you sort of see the way that they're uh, you see evidence of their failures throughout the game. Like, you see their bodies thrown out and stuff like that, and it's it's this kind of, like, environmental storytelling that a lot of the stuff was just in the manual in Metroid 2. AM2R brought it to life within the game with through, env- through good environmental um, design, and Metroid 2, Samus Returns, does the same thing. So it feels like... And not, again, it's like a natural progression, kind of, but I could totally see how Nintendo might be concerned that people might... Conf- might essentially um, accuse them of stealing ideas when it really just is kind of the natural progression of the original Clearly what happened, Jim, was that they heard our podcast and they heard your, uh, you know, raving Mm -hmm. about how good the game was, and then they just went and and ripped it off. Clearly that's what happened. (laughs) Our loyal listeners over at Nintendo. Right, yeah. 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 I I wouldn't really, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they did have people on on the dev team that played Played it. I well, wasn't sure. I'm sure they did. Um, so yeah. So that's my. That's kind of my general talk about it. I will say I didn't. I just touched a little bit on the the music and the sound design, but it is excellent. Um, it really makes you feel concerned and tense huh. throughout the game, which is uh, again nice. a, a complete callback to the original. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, when I say original, I mean both the NES original and the uh, Game Boy. It is a fun game. It's really cool, and I totally recommend everyone check it out. So yeah. how would you rank this Metroid in terms of? Is it your favorite? Is it the best one you've played so far? It's it's a really hard question, mainly because I don't feel like I'm far enough in the game to fairly um, answer it. Uh. A quarter of the way through at most. So I really want to get deeper. I will say that I'm enjoying it a lot, and um, it is a different experience from AM2R, so I don't want to... I know I've co- talked about them in comparison a lot because they're basically based on the same game, but I don't want to harp on that too much. I think they're both solid games. But, um, yeah, I will definitely report back on my 
updated Metroid ranking. I will say it's I can easily already say that it's better than other M, so that's not much of a contest, <laughs> but <laughs> I am enjoying it. I'll say that much. All right, so the other game that I've been playing lately is uh, Heat Signature, which is made by the good old Tom Francis, friend of the podcast, so to speak. <laughs> Um, I suppose indirectly that's true. Yes, <laughs> we've we've <laughs> talked about biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about Gunpoint on the show before. Uh, he's also made Floating Point and, and uh, Morph Blade, two smaller projects, both you know little mini games that he took. I guess he made those as a break from Heat Signature. Um, Heat Signature. I've actually talked about this a little bit on the podcast before because I was in the closed beta uh, last year, a yeah. year and a half ago, something like that. It's like episode sixty-two or three. You talked about that. I think. Yeah. Wow. You've made. We've grown up as a podcast since then. <laughs> Happy <laughs> birthday, guys! <laughs> Woo. So, so Heat Signature is a uh, a game about sneaking aboard procedurally generated spaceships. Uh, you're a guy with a little uh, mini spaceship pod basically and you fly around you dock with uh spaceships that fly around in space and then you can sneak aboard take out enemies you can hijack the ship you can usually there's an objective like stealing something or assassinating a particular target rescue missions um (coughs) capturing the entire ship and flying it back to friendly base that sort of thing yeah what what are you in this game like are you are you just a bounty hunter or a well that's that's the thing because uh Every time you play, um, there is a different character you can choose because all your characters are procedurally generated. Um, Because the idea is that everything is supposed to be uh, kind of expendable. Like if you screw up a mission and you die, that's okay because there's going to just be another one that you can do. And the galaxy's persistent, so the world you're playing in, um, these different characters populate it, and over time you'll... um, sort of liberate different stations and uh you'll see like the territories of different factions change over time cool. um but if you die or if your character dies you can't restart the mission correct no you, you have cannot. to you you might be able to do that a similar mission later but it would be with a different character yes. right okay there's actually a really interesting um kind of cycle of play that seems to happen where each character has a personal mission Mm-hmm. Um, and your personal mission is kind of your long-term goal for that character. And there's this other character that kind of sits in the bar. Um, it's the character you play as during the tutorial. That's Siggy, the podcat. The podcat, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a uh, tutorial where you play as this character, and then basically she retires, um, and she becomes uh, kind of the source of information for you. And so basically she charges you a certain number of credits or whatever the currency is to... Um, find information that's going to help you do whatever it is you're trying to do. But your personal goal can actually include things like, for example, if your character is not killed but captured on a mission, which has happened to me before, um, another character that comes up it might actually have a personal mission of rescuing that character. Oh, um, I actually have a personal mission right now where one of Nick's characters got captured on a different account. Um, and it, because we're Steam friends, it's like, go rescue this character. And then it's like, you know, Nick Kruger's character. Well, that's clever. Um, so- and if I manage to do it, then I actually unlock his character to play as in my game. You can play yeah, a single character. character for a solid two or three hours and not get to the personal mission and then when you finally die on just like a random mission it can be like a punch in the gut mm-hmm. when you're about to get oh, to it, it. it has to some the personal mission great emergent narratives Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Um, actually it has some really cool uh, breath of the wild vibes i think um i got to a point where i finally got the i paid for the information on my personal mission and then realized how difficult that mission was going to be based on the enemies that they had briefings on and that sort of thing goodness um very high difficulty mission and so like hmm i think i need to go do other missions to to get you know to prepare and to get better equipment and to get my tactics up and stuff like that so in that same way that in breath of the wild it's like i could go straight to ganon right now but i probably shouldn't um that's definitely kind of the thing that happens here now could i in theory um manage the mission with just my wrench and my one sidearm probably probably not actually <laughs> it'd be very very difficult well if you have <laughs> enemies with armor you so, can't break through it with a mm, wrench but. so for those of us that don't haven't seen anything about this game because I have not. Mm-hmm. Um, 
talk a little bit more about the gameplay in terms of what is the perspective is it is it uh 2d 3d environment yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a top-down 2d game top-down sprite 2D. based oh you can um, think of it a little bit like a sort of dual stick shooter in the way that it handles. So it sounds like Hotline Miami. It, 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 actu- it actually comparison. plays quite a lot by mm-hmm. hot, like Hotline Miami. Okay. Uh, With um, the, however, um, yeah. it's not so much of an action game as it is more like a strategy game because it's it's almost like a mix between Hotline Miami and uh, Metal Gear Solid. Um, it's stealth because uh, of the stealth aspect. Yeah. And so and when you say Metal Gear Solid, you of course mean the Game Boy Color right. Metal Gear Solid, which is still one of the absolute <laughs> highest ranked games of all time. <laughs> Just yeah, that out there. It yeah. is. <laughs> I shouldn't have said Metal Gear Solid. I mean more Metal Gear. Uh, Metal Gear. Top down. Metal Gear. Metal, Metal Gear. Gear. <laughs> um, Look what you did. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so basically, Emergent topic. Uh, enemies will kill you very quickly if they spot you. Okay. So it, so okay. So it is like you get spotted, you're in trouble. And honestly, Hotline Miami was like that too. It's just you were expected to kill them. Yeah. Whereas in in Metal Gear, you really are expected to avoid them if you can. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. But what's what's cool is that there's um basically there's a whole bunch of different gadgets that you can use that do one very specific thing. Um like there's one that will teleport you from uh one room to another room as long as there's a line of that you can trace in between without like blocking it. So it'll just very quickly run you through the ship, basically. You can swap places with another person. Right. Um, You can teleport items that are in the ship to you. Um, And so there's some really interesting deep strategies you can employ as you get more gadgets and stuff like that. Um, Actually, if you want to check out the launch trailer for this game on YouTube, uh, basically they'll talk you through um, a bit of gameplay and show you some of the possibilities. Yeah, one of of the examples he gives is uh, there's basically a gadget called the Swapper, which, if you uh, target an enemy, you swap places with them. So, so what you can if, do if is if an enemy spots you and they shoot at you, you can swap places with them, and then they be, shoot because themselves. time slows down, you can right the bullet time it goes so, through them. Right. That makes sense. Yep. And you're able to sort of pause at any given point to sort of think about your situation, think of how you're going to do things. Um, it's things it's, it's, got, it's, all, yeah. it's almost like turn based yeah it sounds like a tactical but it's not game. really turn based it, fall active fall time kind of yeah. right yeah like like a tactical turn based yeah yeah. yeah yeah i love those those are great this is the gaming meta news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture i do have a gaming meta segment i would like to talk a little bit about um microtransactions mainly because i've been playing the new nba 2k uh, NBA 2K18 specifically just came out uh, last so if week. If you would like to hear this segment, please send three dollars. Yes, three dollars. No, I'm <laughs> just totally kidding. Uh, actually, you don't. I don't want your real money. I want you to use your real money to buy digital currency, and then you know, I want you to spend that digital currency. Right. See. Get, right. get backwards like compatible bucks at backward-compatible.com. <laughs> yes. Um, BC points. And that's kind of the problem with with this game. So NBA 2K um, and and a lot of sports games have been doing this for a while. Um, EA does it with their sports series as well. The, obviously, the NBA 2K series is by 2K, um, take two. My, my issue here is that it's gotten out of control. They've always had essentially what they call VC, virtual currency. And you earn virtual currency in the game by essentially by playing the game. So if you play a game, you would get a little bit of points. If you play the My Career mode, which is a big uh, allure because you can take a player that you can give your own face and you can choose your characteristics and you can have him... Um, rise through the ranks in the nba yeah that's gonna be big this year i mean like madden's doing it well bunch of, bunch of games are doing they've it. been doing it for a while but they're adding more story to it and actually it's it's that's another issue that i'd like to talk about in a later show about how as they try to make it more more focused on the story it actually disconnects you from your player you mm-hmm. no longer feel like it's you anymore you feel like it's this specific character because um it's a fully voice acted character now it's not my voice and he has a background, like he's a DJ. In fact, that's my nickname. People call me DJ because I'm a former DJ. I'm not a former DJ, but my character <laughs> is. In this game, because of how slowly you earn virtual currency, it actually makes it significantly worse to the point that it's very hard to even get anywhere in the game. Um, I've played probably 40 plus hours already easily and starting from 60 and I'm barely over 70 in terms of my overall score for my player that's a really long time to play and i haven't even bought clothing that's another part of the game so the 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 big appeal of this one was that you have something called my neighborhood 
where, where you have stores and you can sort of go around in this open world, basically. And so it's basically a neighborhood. You've got um, playgrounds where you can play, you know, pick up games of basketball with other players. You have um, a foot locker. You can buy shoes. You have a um, barber shop. You can get a haircut. You can get like tattoos at a tattoo parlor. You can go to uh, uh, different stores and buy different shirts and clothing attires and stuff like that and pants and all that. Seems like the perfect neighborhood for a basketball player. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it was an interesting concept, but everything is so expensive and you earn VC so slowly. And of course, I do it on purpose because you can, of course, buy VC. You can actually purchase it. So basically, to put it in perspective, you earn around... Around 500, 800 VC per game um, to play a game. And a lot of this includes unskippable cutscenes during the game, too, by the way. I mean, I mean before the game, before mm-hmm. and after the game. Something will happen. And it's usually really stupid. The storyline's a complete mess. <laughs> so as I am um, earning this VC, I have like 500 or so. If I want to go and buy a pair of shoes, well, the cheapest pair of shoes that I don't even really want is like 1,500 VC. So if I want a pair that I actually think looks good, I need to spend about 3,000 to 5,000 VC. So it's going to take me many, many games to even afford to buy shoes. That's like six, ten games. Right. Yeah. So it gets worse. So also, you start out with, of course, you start out wearing clothing, but you start out wearing just a, a basic brown shirt and shorts. So you have like a brown shirt, and, and I'm sure it's it's on purpose. It is the color of excrement on purpose. They want you to look terrible, and you do. You look horrible, and you cannot get anyone to play with you. If you go there and you are a – unless you, unless I somehow was already ranked like 85 or 90, but I'm not – uh, people look at you and they go, oh, well, this guy doesn't know what he's doing because he hasn't spent any VC on clothing. So you go have where? to spend VC on Hold clothing. On, wait, wait, wait. Go, go where? Online. Online to play at the playground. There, you, there's kind of like this sort oh. of open lobby area where people can walk around and match up. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's almost like, you know, walking around like a big complex of basketball courts mm-hmm. in the middle of a city. And, and that's you'll... basically what it so is. So it's, it's yeah. real other players. Yeah, you oh, find, yeah. find oh. it. You see them in your neighborhood. They so run like, around. Yeah. They're like, no, this dude's a noob because he's got a poop shirt on. So yes, I don't play exactly. Him. So you have to buy a shirt. Well, the shirts are also expensive. You know, you also have to spend money. You have to spend money to get a haircut, by the way. That costs money. Mm -hmm. Tattoos are very expensive. You can't even get a tattoo until you get a higher overall rating. So you get, um, I signed a a shoe deal with uh, Jordan. It took me a long time before I even got my deal. And um, as part of the deal, I get a whopping 70 virtual currency every (laughs) game for wearing their shoes. 70. The whole thing about people not wanting to play with you because you don't have the nice shirt and you, oh, that's real, though. That is real. People complain. So so I've gone online, too, and I've just to kind of see um, what people's thoughts are. And I've gone to some different forums, including the the subreddit, the NBA 2K subreddit. Um, and there's a lot of complaints there as well for the same things that VC is too slow to gain. Lo- a lot of people trying to share tips on how to gain it quickly. Hmm. Um, anytime there are glitches or cheats, ways to earn it fast, they get patched almost immediately. Uh. However, lots of people's accounts are leaking VC. There's been a tons of complaints where there's some sort of bug going on where um, I haven't experienced it yet, but I have seen a lot of complaints. Sometimes you just don't get VC when you're supposed to. Like It looks like it just doesn't go to your total, and sometimes it just disappears. Oh, yeah, that's totally a bug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they don't fix that. They still haven't fixed that. And so people's, people's accounts has been, have been wiped when they've already spent real money buying VC. Wow. So it's it's a real concern. This year it's gotten a lot worse. And the reason I, I, I did want to talk a little bit about it is just to kind of share some of my frustration with the direction that AAA games are going with microtransactions because it's always been an issue that has been a concern for me. Um, as long as it was considered optional and on the side, it was something that I felt I could live with. But... The restrictions on your player character in this game um, are so harsh that unless I want to play this game for like 300 hours, I'm never going to hit a 90, even a 90 overall, let alone a 99 overall, and without spending real money on VC um, or using some sort of like hack or glitch. Um, and that's really unfortunate that you have to that you literally can't even really get to the point where you can play the game seriously with other people unless you spend real money. Because there are people right now that are already 85 or 90, but that's because they've spent real money on VC. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. All right, so I want to talk about a, a well, dare I call it a board game? Yes, I will. Uh, it's called Sidereal Confluence. Now, catchy. What? <laughs> right? Um, the full title is actually... Can you spell that? 
Uh, well, yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> S-I-D-E-R-E-A-L-C-O-N-F-L-U-E-N-C-E. What? The full title is Sidereal Confluence Trading and Negotiation in the Elysian Quadrant. So, a little bit of context here. It's a space negotiation and trading game. It's almost like, uh, if you think about something like uh, Twilight Imperium or uh, something that robust, but you just sort of zero in on, on the trading aspect and, and strip out all the warfare, that kind of a thing, right? Think maybe civilization, uh, which interestingly enough, if you, if you uh, look for, for some of the uh, interviews and podcasts with the creators, that's actually where it got started. It was a much more robust game that got just one mechanic focused in on and, and stripped out. Well, here, here's what you have. You have a bunch of um, different alien races, and you can play this with four to nine players, which is really pretty cool. And it doesn't slow the game down too terribly much because for the most part, it is simultaneous play, uh, which is brilliant. It, now, is this is this property, is this based on, is this all original or is this based on an completely existing property? Completely original. Completely original. So these and, alien races are just totally made up, new Yeah, and you can, you can detect the influences, as mm-hmm. one would expect. Um, but, you know, you've got everything from, like, these space whales to space dinosaurs uh, to the, the ancient race, which has uploaded itself into droids. I mean, it, it's cool, right? Oh, cool. It's got some fun flavor. Um, but really what the neat thing about it is, is if you take a specific race, you are going to be working with a very unique game mechanic that no one else is going to be playing with. And it depends on the race you take. And it all matches the flavor of that race incredibly well. Um, It's all about upgrading, and it's all about um, running your economy. So there's there's phases, and everyone does the phases together. And and one of the most important phases is the trading and negotiation phase, where you're where you say, hey, um, listen, I have some um, some some biomass materials that I want to trade you for your uh, industrial materials, which my society can't make, but it can uh, produce by running my economy. And as a result of that, I'm going to loan you some of my ships. And the ships are uh, mechanically they're similar to money. If you have if you have ships, you can bid on colonization, um, and and so you can do things like um, bid for research teams. You can use the research teams to then develop uh, technologies, and you can use that technology for one turn. But then afterwards, everybody gets the technology. So it's extremely cooperative. It's still technically competitive in the sense that there will be a winner, but it is, for the most part, about everyone coming together. And that's where the terribly named <laughs> game... The Confluence. ...gets its name. Because sidereal means having to do with the distant stars, mm-hmm. uh, and confluence means coming together. So literally, the name is a coming together of the distant stars. Oh, that's so wonderful, right? Um, but, da, da, da. but the truth is, <laughs> what I really liked about this game... The um, you know. ...was it, it's, it, it knows what it is. It hyper focuses on this trade and negotiation aspect of the game, does not get bogged down in anything else. Every race is completely unique on how it plays. And you, um, you have this mm, asynchronous balance. I- I'm not going to say it's an unbalanced game. It's not. It's very well balanced in the sense that you know, there's checks and balances. But the truth is, if, if you're playing for the first time, grab one of the easy races. And the game tells you which ones are easy and which ones are hard. There are a few that say, if this is your first time playing, um, you should not choose this race. And, and there's, there's even the reverse of that, which is, if, this is uh, if any player's first time playing, then um, like if you're playing against new players, you should not choose this race, in other words. Because you'll just, you'll just wipe the floor with them if they don't know what they're doing. And it's kind of interesting. But literally anything except victory points can be negotiated. And in that sense, it is unlike any game I have ever played. It felt a little bit like diplomacy, except diplomacy works up until the point where you throw the the pieces down on the board and then you attack each other and then someone pulls out and feels totally screwed over. And that never happens in huh. this. Yeah, because as you were talking about it, it, it did remind me somewhat of diplomacy. Yeah. I was, gonna, I was actually going to ask how similar. Phase of, right. But, but the difference stuff. is here, in, in this sense, it's not about a military victory of um, deciding when you're going to lie to someone. It's actually, we're all in this together, and our goal is to create the International Federation of Planets, or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just that someone is going to have their dominant 
mm, philosophy come out ahead. But what, what I really truly loved about the game was that it did not feel like any game I've ever played before. And there was never downtime. You were always having to pay attention to what was going on. And you, in the end, you have this sort of desire, at least I did, to play, almost immediately play again with a different race um, and, and play in a different way. Because I swear, I could play this game nine times before I understood all the different races, the intricacies, and then could choose my favorite. So Sidereal Confluence, it's pretty much a brand new game. Uh, nobody's talking about it, really. Um, but if you really like economy games, and you like that aspect of it, check it out. Uh, I think it's going to surprise you. Cool. You will not find beautiful art in it. You will find utilitarian art in it. Um, I would love there to be a second edition, which just really exploded out in, in, in beauty. But it doesn't matter, and it doesn't hurt the gameplay any. What it really focuses on is um, interacting with the other player. You know, In some senses, it feels a lot like Roll for the Galaxy or games like this. But I find that even Roll for the Galaxy, you're playing a game by yourself with other people and trying to beat them to the win. Sidereal Confluence is absolutely about other players and interacting with other players. No economy can win on its own. No race can win on its own. If you just sit and you just do your own thing, you can not win. That is hard-coded into the game. Nice. Um, and, and I just love that aspect of it. So, um, yeah. Check that's, it out. All right, folks, cool. check out Sidecar Cornfield. And- <laughs> <laughs> that Thanks, sounds Nate. right to me. That's, that's, yeah. yeah, that's perfect. It. <laughs> and now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Actually, I think a lot of the games that we've talked about today um, have emergent gameplay in them. Mm-hmm. I know Heat Signature... Um, definitely oh, that's did. The whole, that's the whole point. Yeah, uh, arguably NBA it, 2K has a lo- has that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, arguably any game will have some emergent properties to well, it. Well, I mean, I mean a large amount though. Yeah, like for example, in NBA 2K, um, there's multiple modes. One of the modes that I'm actually enjoying more than my career, which because I don't have to spend VC, uh, is uh, the my the my league mode or my team mode, where basically you get to create your own uh, team. And I, I actually have created an expansion team out of El Paso for some reason because I don't know. I feel like they just need a team. And um, I, I created my own team, and I'm running through simulating games and only only playing occasionally. Um, and I find it very interesting going through the draft, trading draft picks. It's very much a, oh, I wonder what's going to happen in the league. And I have to have some weird things happen, some very strange trades going through. Um, you know, Le- LeBron James uh, to the Houston Rockets has already occurred in my storyline, which I hope happens in real life, by the way. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but of course, I don't. That's not my team, so it's actually not good because they kind of have a powerhouse team now, and El Paso is not very good. Um, but it's it's that sort of uh, element is, is occurring because in the the my team because it's like a simulated space, a simulated um, a simulated NBA basically. So the sto- it's more of the the emergent gameplay is all in the storylines and the drafting and kind of the background stuff and less so in the actual basketball part. I, I think you could also argue that basketball and any like real sport uh, has emergent elements in its quote unquote gameplay anyway, because sure. basically you're just setting up a system of rules and winning conditions and then letting the players choose their plays or i guess it's the coach choosing plays. yeah any any competitive game really not just sports um yeah you know chess has a meta of its own um and every game's gonna play a little bit differently well, let's before we get too much into this let's take a step back and i kind of wanted to ask doc because he's our resident doc um <laughs> hey. to maybe give us a you know just like a, an easy explanation like emergent gameplay for people that are hearing us talk about it that are not quite sure what we're talking about they think they know but they're not quite sure well, you say that like it was one of the four cornerstones of my dissertation, <laughs> which, it, which it was. Um, okay, so uh, actually, whenever I, I did write on this stuff, admittedly, it was 10 years ago, whenever it was um, just emerging, uh, and it was being called emerging media, and nobody was quite sure exactly what that meant or how to define it or what the four walls of that was. But w- the first one, the one that was almost always at the top of the list was emergent properties, mm. that we knew... That, that there was something which was greater than the sum of its parts, which was going to play into this new media stuff, that it was going to be 
procedural in some way, that it was going to have a human element in some way. Uh, it's like whenever you are on an MMORPG and they don't rate it because it says, uh, you know, rating may change on online play right. with human interaction. Right. Basically, some, some guy walks up to you and just types obscenities at you. You know, that, oh, well, that just kicked it into an M, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, nobody was quite comfortable yet um, nailing down what that meant. Uh, but now we have a decade or so under our belt. Um, and if you go back as far as like uh, 2001 with the, you know, the birth of alternate reality games and that sort of thing, you can actually almost say that we've got like, you know, 18 almost 18 years under our belt. So we're we're pushing up on two decades here with this new media stuff. What is it? This emergent gameplay, what is it? So I'm pretty confident being able to say that whenever we talk about this idea of emergent gameplay, what we're really talking about is being able to shift the creative element on some level over to the player. And so what you've got is, let's call it a toolkit that the game designer has. And that toolkit is, hey, you want to decide what this uh, alien looks like? Uh, Okay, as the designer of this game, this is what the alien looks like. Well, what if I throw that toolkit to the player and the player gets to decide what the character looks like, what the alien looks like, how it plays, that sort of thing. I'm talking specifically of Spore here, which is like, what, 2002, 2003? I forget. Um, But uh, see, I was thinking, even when you're talking about, about that, other games do that too now. I well, mean, now they do. And it's becoming more common, common now. Yeah. Back then it was revolutionary and people gave, gave Spore a lot of flack for, for its experimentive gameplay. Well, uh, I think most of what Spore got flack for was the fact that it's, uh, it didn't live up to what was promised. When well, it was first you know, announced. originally it was called Sim Everything and back in the original E3 video, which you can still find online, yeah. it was a very, very different game. So oh, I yeah. think the producers got in the way of that, but there, let's, not, let's not fault. I, I might that be, being said, it's still pretty innovative for its it, time. It was extremely innovative for its time. And all of that is to say, and I don't want to get hung up on, on Spore, because <laughs> that's, that's a very old game. Let's talk about some of the newer um, examples of this, and we have already in this, this episode. Um, but I think the idea behind it is uh, there's a fundamental question behind it, which is um, how much freedom can you give the player before it breaks? And, and I think for me, where that breaks down, um, when you get into a game like Gary's Mod. Oh, good example. Where, where I mean, you can kind of do sort of whatever you want, but it feels very um, aimless. Yes. And I, and I lose interest. Until a point where... And, and, and the great place to look for this is YouTube. And I'll circle back around to uh-huh. why that's important. But um, until you enter into certain spaces in Gary's Mod, which become scenario-driven again, you're at the top of a giant hill. You have 90 seconds or five minutes or whatever it is to build a thing to get down the hill and you race and mm-hmm. you go. And it becomes – and it's, it's a snowy hill, mm-hmm. right? And so you you basically – you're bobsledding – down the hill and seeing, oh, I, I built a bathtub and it turns out that was way better than uh, the actual snowmobile. Mm. Ha 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 ha. Right. And then you do it again and again and again. And then it becomes gamified. And the irony, the deep irony in that is that once once you push past that point where it's aimless and back into giving it a, a set of victory conditions again and um, maybe even restrictions in some form uh, or, or a place to play like the mountain. The find space, to find yeah, rules, the, the find four victory elements condition. Of, of game that we've talked about in, in, the, in the cast before. Um, it, you know, once you get back into that space again, then it becomes, um, well, it becomes a game again. Mm-hmm. And, and so that, that's, that's a good point. That's I interesting. mean, I, I think it depends. And it definitely, Jerry Spawn has, has, a, has a pretty big <laughs> fan base too. And I think a big mm-hmm. part of Huge. games like that and then other, other simulators like, you know, Goat Simulator, for example, is mm-hmm. all built on emergent gameplay. Uh, but a lot of those are, are really almost like, and Gary's Mind is this, this way to an extent. I think Goat Simulator is almost 100% this way. They're made, they're these environments that are made for, for not so much even for the player to enjoy, but for them to record experiences and then for others to watch and enjoy, like on YouTube. Awesome. It's become, that's become its own market. Yes. Incredibly important connection you just made. Okay, so uh, I wrote an essay about this in 2012 and uh, had the opportunity to go to a conference in Oxford and actually talk about it. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the the neat thing about the model that that I came up with was that it sort of solved this problem. The terrible thing about it was I appropriated terms that not everybody understood or agreed with. So my terms were authenticity and validity. And what I defined validity as is basically a developer story in mm-hmm. this context. And what I defined authenticity as is what we should call player story. And I wish I'd just used those terms. But um, if we do talk about it on that spectrum and call that, say, uh, the, the y-axis, the x-axis in this two by two is going to be something like story versus mechanics. Mm. And my whole point of doing this was to simply say that the old debate of is it story or is it mechanics or is it both is only one dimension that we can kick it into a second dimension or more by adding in other variables and and turning it into a two by two, which is a very scientific thing to do. Mm. Um, And in this case, exactly what I was talking about in that context was emergent gameplay. What happens whenever you hand control of the story from an emergent sense to the player? And the, the answer is that audience becomes player. And I'll, I'll say that again because that's, I think, what we're really talking about here is there's a spectrum where on one end you're simply audience and on the other end you are almost like content creator. Mm. And we're extremely comfortable with that paradigm as gamers because we expect to be in control to some extent. Even if we're on a rail, even if it's a completely linear story, even if it's, you know, Mario, still we have some element of control or what we would call agency in a classical sense and say, um, yeah, yeah, Mario died, but it was my fault. I pushed the jump button. He fell to his death. Yeah, no, I think... I- for me, when, I, when we're ta- when we're thinking about, when I'm thinking of emergent gameplay, um, and games where, where that's the entire appeal of of the game is mm-hmm. emergent gameplay, and I'm thinking of games that are very simulation driven and simulation heavy. Um, one of the games that I was thinking of is one that I haven't returned to recently, but I talked about it on the podcast maybe uh, 20 episodes ago or so. It's called Total Extreme Wrestling. Oh yeah, um, and oh, it's yeah. <laughs> it's a text based wrestling simulation, and you you. Create your own wrestling federation. You have your own wrestlers. You book your own shows. You determine the winners and losers and how they're going to win and lose. And your whole goal is is not, I'm going to get in the ring and, and beat up this other wrestler, like, say, in a WWE wrestling game. But instead, it's, I need, I need to put butts in the seats. I need to generate revenue. Mm-hmm. I need to keep my wrestlers happy. You know, I'm, I'm the GM of this company. I'm running the show. I'm, not, I'm putting on the show. I'm not controlling the wrestlers. It tells me what happens in the wrestling match. I don't control the wrestlers at all. So the gameplay is really just creating scenarios and creating mm-hmm. my own mm-hmm. storylines and trying to see what works and what doesn't work and what audience am I trying to appeal to. And I'm in this, this city now, and they're hardcore wrestling fans, and I better give them a real wrestling show. And now I'm in a different city, and you know I know that they're going to bring a lot of kids to the show, and I need to be a little careful about how hardcore I get because the parents might complain and I might lose revenue. So... There's all these different considerations that go into it, but the storylines that can come out of it are incredible. And a lot of this is AI-driven, simulation-driven. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a really well-made game, actually. Um, but and they, they do a new release every year, actually. Uh, but it's really it's really cool. But all these weird storylines come out of it with um, the wrestlers. A lot of times, I actually download real wrestling packs so I have real people because it's more fun that way. Yeah. <laughs> just to kind of see what they might do. But you get weird scenarios where, like, you can give. Uh, you know, Undertaker, like a surfer gimmick and see how that works. And sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't. And it's just kind of weird to see, okay, what's that like? Undertaker is a surfer. I mean, <laughs> why not? Right. He comes to the ring, he surfs in on a surfboard, you know, he's like, cowabunga dudes. I mean, why not? Right. So just give him that character, see what happens. Call him undertow and you've got it. Yeah. I think I gave him some stupid name like that. <laughs> I can't even remember. I just remember wanting to do it. Cause it was like the most opposite thing I can think of from an undertaker, mm-hmm. like the, 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 the most, overgiver. Right. Yeah. The most like, like corny, Santa. corny, happy go lucky, not a care in the world character that I character gimmick that I could possibly think of. But, and, and, and part of that too, it's like, when you look at it, 
what is really the gameplay there? Like, what game am I really playing? It's like when I do the the NBA with the with the my team, right. and I'm not even playing. I'm not even playing most of the games. I'm simulating the games, but I'm having fun because I want to see what the league is like, and I want to do the backroom deals and such mm-hmm. like that. So, so maybe talk. Maybe we should talk a little bit about why that aspect of it of creating the environment. It's the same thing with that you see in The Sims too. You're you're not controlling those characters. You're creating an environment in which they react. You've been given a different tool set. Yes, and yet. And then you just kind of like let it go and watch what happens and watch watch the chaos or maybe the organization or whatever it is. I mean, why do we find that so interesting? Is it like the the looking at an ant an ant farm kind of situation? Or I mean, what is that? Actually, I think we can answer that question by looking at a completely different kind of game. Okay, like Breath of the Wild, mm. because Breath of the Wild falls into this category too. Even though it is an extremely tight and very very sort of closed game in one sense. There's stuff you can do. There's stuff you can't do. There's recipes that work. There's recipes that don't work. There's places you can go. There's places you can't go. All the shrines are very... I mean, there's nothing procedurally generated about it. It was yeah. it was very um, constructed. It's a very curated world. And yet, we've talked many times since it came out, you can go anywhere you want. You can do anything you want. You can do it in the order you want. Mm-hmm. And it feels like you have complete control over stuff. And I assure you, even though I've played hundreds of hours now, and, and you guys have too, we could talk for the rest of the afternoon about the differences in our experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, no, I, and I haven't totally. beaten the game yet. <clears throat> and, and part of that, too, is um, for a game like that, the physics engine that it has and the sort of things that you, the, the way that things react in the environment – um, creates all these opportunities to have unique experiences. Yeah, ironically, yeah. it's the consistency of that natural world, which is not a realistic one at all. Oh, no. Uh, but it has its own <laughs> rules of, of sort of physics and nature and how fire works and all of that. You know, you create enough fire, there will be an updraft. Always. You create enough fire, you're going to melt ice. Always. You know what I mean? And, and, and so in that sense, you can, you can work with it. And the whole design philosophy behind that is basically to present the player with a problem to solve and not necessarily spell out a solution for them, but to let them use the tools that they've learned in their environment Multiple to achieve Multiple solutions. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well said. Yes. And so I, I, I love what you just said, Nick, because that I think is the best answer to the moment uh, for the question which what, yeah. you opened with, Jim, mm-hmm. which what is, is what is emergent gameplay? And I think it's it's a problem with multiple solutions within the context of the mechanics. I like that. that so let's sense. jump off from that and, and talk about other games that, that do that. Well, I think that we can't talk about emergent gameplay without talking about Minecraft. Um, Never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that I know that you've played it. I think everyone has at I least played tried that heck it. Out of that oh, game. Um, oh my god! Minecraft, Minecraft, yeah. Yeah, I'm not really a huge fan, to be perfectly honest with you. I never really got into it, but it's it's become a cultural phenomenon. Yeah, um, and it's 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 very very popular. It actually helped to drive the um, the let's game the let's game. Um, game. Let's, let's play. Let me let's play phenomenon. It's it's driving the let's play or. Sort of started the let's play phenomenon sure in a did. way. I mean, it's it, it at least popularized it. I mean, there were let's plays before, but this is where a lot of people were able to start like making a living on yeah. YouTube yeah. with Exa- let's plays alone. Exactly. I would point to the Yogg's cast; those guys were always my favorite. Yeah, and now they're struggling a little bit because they you can almost read it in their voice. They they're actually really sick of Minecraft, <laughs> but they can't stop because that's what they do. I think mm-hmm. I think Minecraft has actually it's definitely fallen in terms of. Um, ubiquity. Like yeah. It used to be everyone played it, or yeah. at least it felt that way. Yeah. And now it's more really, really like like young kids will still play it, mm-hmm. but that's kind of it. And yeah, then like I a few other people. Last year, I found that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I yeah. talked about that experience yeah. Yeah. of finding it out because it was my guilty pleasure game. And I started a server and I did all these mods and I invited a bunch of people and nobody showed up. And I'm like, what? Yeah, it's. And that's because it had a stigma and I had no idea. It's, it's not even just the stigma. I think it's like it, it's like anything else. Eventually it gets old. It's play and there's other gaming experiences like we just talked about Breath of the Wild that has a very I mean it's I'm not trying to compare it to Minecraft it's a different experience mm-hmm. but it, they're both you know it's both examples of emergent gameplay and um, perhaps people have just found other ways to use it I mean there there were lessons that I think game designers learned from Minecraft or at least from Minecraft's success mm-hmm. that they were able to borrow and apply to to their games. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, Minecraft is one of those games that's so successful that there isn't going to be a game after it that doesn't take some influence. From sure, it. of mm-hmm. course, and mm-hmm. and I think that's and I do think you can see that influence. Even though I'm not a Minecraft fan, I can see that influence um, in games like Breath of the Wild, and I I can you know 
still respect the game, even though I'm not a fan of it, mm-hmm. for what it has brought to gaming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Minecraft popularized the crafting system. Just in many in ways, yes, it did. In some ways, yeah. Yeah, and you could compare it to others which haven't done so well, like Creativeverse. I was in on the ground floor of that one uh, as one of the testers, and it had so much potential. And they focused in on the wrong things, unfortunately, and uh, I think Playful's just kind of run that one into the ground. I've never even heard of it, so there you yeah, go. Yeah, <laughs> it, and it, 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 was, it was this great little game that mm, I think Belgium really latched onto it for a while, but mm. uh, it just didn't catch on. It just didn't. What are some other examples of, of games that are really really great examples of, of emergent gameplay? So some of the ones that I always like to point to, um, XCOM has really great emergent gameplay. Mm. Um, Civilization. Oh, Civilization's um, a great one. Good yeah. example. Um, because every single time you play through it, it's going to be a little bit different, even though... It, it, Gandhi's always a jerk. <laughs> He's always going to probably... <laughs> at at least when you hit the atomic age, but yeah. then, yes. Um, Do not let him get nukes. Crusader Kings 2 is one that I like to cite a lot. So um, I think Doc mentioned that a little bit earlier, yeah, too. Played that That's one. a fun... I like that game, especially with mods, where mm-hmm. you can... Um, change your experience. I know for a while people had a Game of Thrones mod for mm-hmm, yeah. Crusader King, oh, Kings 2 that was very popular. It was probably about, geez, five years ago where that mod was was huge. Never played it, but I've seen it played. It was pretty pretty interesting to watch, actually. Because basically yeah. the, the, the goal, at least the implied goal that I got in the few things that I watched was it's a race for the dragons. And then once you've got a dragon, you just rule the world because you can just go and wipe people out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that's cool. But... Uh, and I think that what's really cool about these and, you know, they're, they're emergent mechanical things, too, and then also mer- emergent narrative things. Like I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the show, kind of I can tell someone a story of how my playthrough of this thing went. Yeah. So um, a great example that I might have said before on the podcast, I'm not sure. Um, when I was playing XCOM Enemy Unknown, um, I had these and you have like this squad that you build up and they're, they're named and they're randomly generated. You can mm-hmm. customize them if you want, but I usually don't. But over time, it's like you go through enough missions with these guys that they start feeling Feeling like characters that you get attached to them yeah right? you definitely get attached yeah. to them and then when they die it's heart-wrenching yeah. um and so there's this one mission where having and especially the first time through any of these games when you don't know what to expect it's especially interesting mm-hmm. um because i felt like i was doing pretty well my tactics were getting better i had a good squad that was you know survivable and all this different stuff mm-hmm. and then this new breed of aliens appears that i've never seen before um i was sent in and like there were sort of these mysterious circumstances so i knew it's like okay we don't know what we're gonna find down here but i wasn't expecting this Mm -hmm. and these things just wipe the floor with me because what they do is that they basically kill you kill people in one hit if they can get up to you and then they'll sometimes like turn them into more minions or zombify them or something like Mm -hmm. that to the point where they turn on you um and so that sounds terrible i I just got overwhelmed super quickly and even before i could have people rush back to the ship to evacuate they all just got wiped Mm -hmm. and so i had a total party wipe at a pretty key turning point in the game um and what's great about xcom is that very rarely do you just get a game over because like oh you failed the main story mission um it definitely doesn't help but you're never it's never game over until kind of the the stated end condition of this goal that the aliens have been working on has been achieved Mm -hmm. um they give you very fair warning for that and so there's like this really just interesting emergent moment for me when um one i was just super taken aback by this surprising turn and then also i can say like hey these people who i can look at their histories and you can go and actually look at the more memorials and see Mm -hmm. uh, what rank they were what mission they died on that sort of thing um it's like i i had seen their stories up until that point and then they die and now it's almost like a new XCOM in a sense because some yeah. of my key players are all gone and now the the younger ones are having to sort of take their place and yeah. it was this really interesting thing that came out of hmm. the systems that were built into the game and, and in, in a normal game that would be like a scripted story event yeah. right and that's kind of that's kind of what I what I've noticed I'm noticing from all these stories and, and I know Doc talk, talks some about it earlier but um, it's like the the basically with this with this emerging gameplay it allows you to Create your own story, your own experience that becomes personalized to to you. That's mm-hmm. right, and that's that's the fun part of these games. I mean, that's the yeah. part that I think that kind of answers my question from before about you know what's the appeal here. It's that you get to have a, your a personalized experience that yes. is really unique to you mm-hmm. that you can share with other people. I would call it a water cooler experience. Mm-hmm. Meaning, mm-hmm. you know, referring back to you're you're at the office, you're you're at the water cooler, you see a coworker, and you're like. Oh, oh, hey! Did you did you see that episode of so and so last night? Well, now we talk about video games that way. Mm-hmm. Only the emergent gameplay games were like, so how did you get past that part where? Mm-hmm. And and you could talk about that alien in XCOM, or you could talk about the divine beast in Breath of the Wild, or, or whatever the game is. Right. And uh, and you could be like, so when you got to that one thing, 
how'd you do that? And, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, well, I, I lit it on fire or mm-hmm. I, I camped out or I did this thing. And, and it's very, very different than, hey, did you come up with that solution that's the correct solution right. for doing yeah. the yeah. How did you figure it out? Yeah. That's a completely different line of thinking. So I think the key question may be, um, how did you dot, dot, dot. Mm-hmm. And if that answer of, of how can be answered in a completely different way, you may be dealing with some emergent gameplay there. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I think, th- and I think yeah. that we do need to make that distinction because I know earlier we talked a little bit about, um, you know, yes, sports games, you have these rules. If you're just looking at, say, playing basketball or something, but I wouldn't necessarily say, um, oh, well, my plan was... Uh, to do a lot of perimeter shooting. I didn't really drive to the basket, and that's how I beat that no, team. No, that's a strategy. That's, that's a strategy, right. So I, I do want to make that distinction. Yeah. Same thing with, you know, in a Mario game, um, you might your strategy might be, I'm going to make sure that I pick up the star before I run over to the Hammer Bros to kill them, because if I go at them, you know, as small Mario, I could die, and that's how I got past them. I wouldn't say that that's an example of a merge game. No, I, 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 strategy I would say it is kind of an example, but it's not to the same degree that, like, yeah, not of the, the same level. Is. Well, and, and it's important, I think, we've, we've mentioned procedurally mm-hmm. generated content in this episode, too. I think it's really important for us to put a big red flag next to that and go, we are not actually talking about procedural mm-hmm. content generation by definition. Mm-hmm. This is not necessarily a part of it. Sometimes right. procedurality lends itself very well to emergence. Sometimes right. it does. Mm-hmm. And sometimes games have no procedurality in them at all. I would point to the games by Tomorrow Corporation, which I talked about mm-hmm. three, four episodes ago. Uh, like, for example, Human Resource Machine mm-hmm. uh, and, and World of Goo, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of different possible solutions. There's so many different ways to do that, mm-hmm. but everyone is presented with the same problem. Mm-hmm. It's not a procedurally generated problem that reminds unlike me. XCOM which is procedurally yeah. generated uh, and yet it still has certain types of missions it Correct. still has certain sort of milestone missions that are always going to be the same essentially yeah and you could point to like the Diablo series something like that mm-hmm. fundamentally it's the same gameplay experience to a level where uh, you know at a granular level we can talk about oh you, did, did you ever encounter so and so yeah I did well you know the right way to beat him is this mm-hmm. and that's a procedurally generated mm-hmm. game that still has a very distinct strategy mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Um, and, and I don't know that emergent gameplay plays as big of a, a part in that as even something which is completely set in stone as a human resource machine, which is really teaching you how to code. Well, there's also the games like Thief and Deus Ex and oh, Dishonored. Good, good examples. Yeah. Which are completely curated, completely, uh, you know, no procedurality whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, like Breath of the Wild, it sets up a problem, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. take out your target or go steal the thing or whatever. And you have all these different ways that you can approach right. it. You have so yeah. many different yeah. tools and so many resources, so many... The, the 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 level design is open enough that you can approach it from different yeah. angles. Yeah, I mean, Thief was always, um, you know, a series that I, that I have a lot of respect for because of the the many different ways that you can approach your missions. I mean, it was always it's one of those things where you can get really kind of um, kind of complex with mm-hmm. what you do. Where um, oh, I I I have to, you have to investigate this guy, and I can tell he's going to be walking this path at this time of day, and then I can this point i can set it up so that he goes this direction and i can hit him on the back of the head and i can hide right. his body or you can just do something like you could just literally just do like a super different approach where you sneak in and when no one's around and no one sees you and you grab it and you leave and like you you can spend five minutes on a mission or you could spend and i and i have like two hours on the same mission because you, because yeah. the way the approach that you're taking is so different yep. and as as you react in the environment the environment is reacting to you you know hitman the early Hitman series, yeah. especially um, later on, it was a little bit different. But um, I think it was Hitman Two is where it hit its strength and stride. And I'm reminded specifically of the um, the mission where you you have to go into the theater and kill one of the actors. And there's so many different ways to do this. You can get a like a sniper rifle and get up high and snipe him, or you can switch his. Um, prop gun out for a real gun uh, and then have someone else like basically shoot him. Yeah. I mean, there's so many ways to do this. There's a stealth way. There's a run and gun way. And, and I just love that that whole series is approach to how that's done. And when, when it's done right, I think that's where games like Assassin's Creed shine. Where you've got these, these missions or these moments where you can approach that assassination all these different ways. And where I think it falls apart is whenever they forget that. 
Mm. And, you know, even a couple of, a couple episodes ago, we talked about the idea of over leveling and, and under leveling <laughs> in mm. your case, Chris. Mm. Um, and, and I think that a lot of that has to do with emergent gameplay as well. I think it ties in very, very closely to this idea of, am I going to, to grind up to a certain level and get some, you know, make, make it easy mm. or not make it easy. And that ties in also to this full on, I'm going to curate my own experience as a player because I can. Do, do we want to, or do we need to, I should say, um, talk any about like open world sandbox games like Grand Theft Auto, Red Dead Redemption, um, these open world experiences where, yes, you have a guiding storyline and you have missions that are supposed to be completed in more or less the same way. But then outside of the mission, you're in this space and you can kind of do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And there are people that have their own uh, mind, if you will, Mm -hmm. and they go about their own day and they have their own routines and you can um, disrupt those routines in in multiple ways. Like you can can rob them, you can hit them with your car, you can push them out of the way, um, you can ignore them completely. So are, is is there? You, we would all agree that those are, that's an example of emergent gameplay, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but it, it's also not really achieving any sort of goal. Also true. Um, uh, well, it depends on how you're defining goal, though. Well, mechanically, there's no XP being earned, and right. you're not leveling up, but you're earning money. But like in, like in Red Dead Redemption or in Grand Theft Auto, you rob people, um, and in doing so, you earn money. That's true. And so you can do that. You can go into banks and you can you can rob banks. You can rob like little, you know, stores. Like Gambling. Just like 7-Eleven or something. Poker. Um, yeah. Those are the games within games that we talked about yeah. last time. Um, and in a different sense, you know, going back to the Gary's Mod example, um, you could make a little game for yourself out of seeing how many pedestrians you can strike with your car on this pier um, or having a race with other people in an online mode or something like that where it wasn't designed into the game. And so I think what we're sort of discovering is there's a lot of different types of emergence and a lot of different... That's kind of what I was getting at yeah. because yeah. There, it's, it's a very different... Like if I say, okay, well, Red Dead Redemption has emergent gameplay, and I think it does. Mm-hmm. And Breath of the Wild has emergent gameplay. It does. Mm-hmm. And Total Extreme Wrestling has emergent gameplay. NBA 2K, the my team mm. has has a yeah the, the career mode the yeah, career like, mode these going, are very going through a season you've kind of got a storyline like we said like you know strategies aren't emergence necessarily but you can see like I think that there's maybe an element to dominant strategies emerging trends and strategies but also if I play through a season of my career there's like a storyline that goes with like oh yeah I was injured this game and so we had to like climb back through the ratings right um, or the rankings in order to get into the playoffs and then like oh man we almost lost the playoffs series but then we came back and won four straight or if you're if you're doing really well Mm -hmm. um as a rookie in your rookie season um storylines kind of develop of oh hey who's gonna win rookie mvp Mm -hmm. and there's other players and those other players that are in contention for rookie mvp well that's different it depends on how those how players are performing did did somebody get injured that might have been one of your rivals well i mean that happens and it's all i don't want to say random there are there's a chance of these things happening Mm -hmm. and there's a system that's behind it and there's of course ai that drives it but it varies. Everybody's going to have a slightly different experience. I think they're taking away some of that in NBA 2K because of the storyline that they're adding to it. There is definitely a direct storyline. Like, for example, there was a game where, um, and I, I know this was scripted because the, start, the thing came right after it. I literally couldn't hit a shot to save my life. I couldn't hit a shot. Mm-hmm. And I didn't understand what was going on. And um, it was extremely frustrating. And then when I got out, they had a storyline about how oh, I, I just had an off night and it was a bad game and all of a sudden I, and I was like, well, okay. So really... I was, I was supposed to do that. I was supposed to do that, yeah. exactly. So, and it's always frustrating when they do that, right. where so like they, they, they force something to and happen. And they, they're doing that a yeah. lot in my career, so I would they actually... Just, they should just read whether or not you're doing well and mm-hmm. then add a cutscene. When, when you actually have an off night. Yeah, yeah but, <laughs> then, but the thing is they're trying to... The storyline is actually a lot more guided this year, mm-hmm. so they really are trying to make you hit certain points in the storyline right. and like when you become a starter, it's a little bit sooner than makes sense to be honest with you Mm. given my current ability um my player's ability i should say so i I would actually back away from calling my career emergent to be honest with Mm. you but i think definitely when you're looking at my league Mm -hmm. or my gm you know those modes where you're like you're running a team and there's all these things that are happening there's all these trades that are going on and like there's a storyline that's happening in the in the league in the nba that is completely unique it's a totally unique experience like you know for me 
the, the, the players that were drafted went to different teams and players that became free agents, they left. Like, for example, um, you know, in real life, the Warriors basically stayed together. I mean, their main players stayed together. But in my game, oh, um, you know, Steph Curry is doesn't have to sign with the Warriors. He's, you know, they, they, they didn't want to pay his contract. So now he plays for the Denver Nuggets. And that's now, is that of... realistic? <laughs> no. But that's what happened in, in my game. In my story, Steph Curry is, is and the Denver Nuggets are a dominant team in the NBA. And what's interesting about that is <laughs> it's basically derived NBA. from the system. It's looking <laughs> right, at the exactly. team's budgets and stuff like it's that. It's looking at the budgets, mm-hmm. and like the Warriors looked at it, and they're like, you know what? We don't want to pay you all this money. Or actually, I think what happened was Denver paid them, paid them more. But yeah, I mean, that's one of those things. And, and maybe they're not accounting for the human factor here, but it does make for an interesting story. Mm-hmm. And one of the things they do as well, which I like, is when you create a rookie class, um, draft class, in NBA, it says it gives you a, a message pops up and it says, would you like to create to assign random um, storyline variables to this rookie class? So it might change their stats kind somewhat, but it's going to be more interesting. Hmm. It actually says that in the message. Neat. And I, of course, said yes. Mm-hmm. And that's them kind of giving you like a hint. It's like, hey, there's stuff that's going to happen here. And so far, only a little bit's kind of happened. There's like been some rival rivalries mm-hmm. and stuff like that, but um, it's giving you that that note of like, hey, there's some emergent gameplay that's going to happen here. It's going to be different for everybody with these with these rookies. There's going to be things that are happening because um, w- when we generate these characters, and so you need to understand that's what you're going to get. And so I-, I like that they give you the option. I'm, I'm kind of curious about who would say no i don't want that but (laughs) i guess if they really don't want the stats to change at all and they're a little worried about that maybe but um but it's it it is interesting that they're able to create um a a totally different experience for a game that really it's supposed to just be about playing basketball Mm -hmm. but instead it's about creating your league and your team and and having this totally different story and a totally different (laughs) Well, experience. because we attach narratives to real life sports too, I think it's just a natural thing. Yeah. And we've talked before about, you know, Doc. One of your favorite quotes is, "We told story told ourselves into existence." Yep. Um, yeah. We look for patterns, we look for stories, and so even when there maybe arguably isn't really one, um, I mean, ESPN and other sort of sports talk, whatever, um, they thrive off of the narratives they build around these things. Mm. Um, you sort of get down on an objective level and say that this game is between this team with these players and this team with these players. And based on, say, stats, if you just want to go like purely numbers based, but maybe not even that, um, you know, we think this team has a better chance to win because of this or they this their strategy counters this strategy or something like that. But what we get is a lot of extra stuff about, um, you know, sort of people's personal performance and things about, oh, this team's like had a uh, even if they would realistically probably have the advantage going into this game, they've been on a losing streak. And so that affects our perception, maybe even the player's perception of what their chances are going into this next game. So the context surrounding stuff we take and attach narratives to. And I think that the same thing is kind of what um, makes emergent gameplay and emergent narratives in games um, very appealing because it's just part of our nature. I agree with that. Hmm. And I think that whenever there is a story that's being sort of shoved down our throat, what to to use the terms I I used earlier, what's happening is it feels inauthentic Mm -hmm. because what we're getting is developer story as opposed to emergent story. And it really begs the old question. If you were going to make a game out of Hamlet, that's Shakespeare, by the way, Mm -hmm. uh, could you do it? And and I think the answer is no. Um, Because as soon as you decide to tell a story like mm, Romeo and Juliet, or uh, let's say, Uh, a Scottish play, Mm -hmm. right? It would probably have to be like a really loose adaptation, kind of like what, um, what was it like Inferno or what was it like the, the video game that's based on Dante's Inferno, but it's like very loose. Yeah. But I'm I'm not saying it it would be good, but I'm almost picturing now, like kind of the, the, um, the action beat him up version of Hamlet or like you are Hamlet. (laughs) Like that's probably what would happen. Unfortunately, I I agree with you. But the, (laughs) The point is this, that that story is about, the failure that happens in that specific way. And it's so finely tuned and so poetically pure. Mm-hmm. And it's got those beats in just the right place that, you know, it, it, as soon as you are Macbeth and can make a different choice, uh, you know, about not murdering uh, Duncan, it's like 
that that stops being Hamlet. Mm. You see what I'm saying? And yet I think that we could uh, also, Hamlet, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that we could that. also create games that through play evoke the same sorts of feelings and themes and poetry, if you will, of those plays, but in a different way. Right. Well, it will, it'll never be, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say never because AI mm-hmm. is advancing all the time, but mm-hmm. it, it's not going to be for now, uh, anywhere near as perfect and refined as a, just written story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, and that's the point, I think. I think yeah. that's incredibly insightful, is that if you've got this extremely tight narrative that you want to get across, then you need to do a linear on-rails game, and there's nothing wrong with a linear on-rails game. And if you're going to do that in an open world like GTA, then you're going to have to have those mission points, and they come in sequence. And you can kind of mix it up a little bit by having three or four different story threads that are going on at once, you know, and they're asynchronous. But still, each each thread unto itself is going to be linear. Mm. Do you see, then that's exactly what they do yeah. in, in GTA. The the mission point shows up, and you've got a new place on your map you need to go it, to start the mission. It just depends on... Red Dead is very sto- linear. Right. It depends on the story that you want to tell and and how much of a personal touch you want to give the player. Right. Because on in a game like Red Dead Redemption, all the parts in between the story missions... That's what you. That's you. That's the player's personal story. Exactly. But the actual story itself. No, it's it's the story. And the same thing mm-hmm. with GTA. The same thing with Bully. There might be a choice or two oh, along example. the way, um, and there are there are definitely some choices that change it. But okay. they're very clear choices, and it's just a branching story. It's so at that subtle. Point. This is this well. Is... Some of them are pretty big. At the end of GTA Five, you have a pretty big choice. Well, what I mean is, the... I don't want to spoil a five year old game. Sure, right. <laughs> but what I mean is, if that... you haven't played it. You, Please, just you play replay it, it mm-hmm. and you and you choose the other binary choice, and you've seen right. both endings. Exactly, exactly. That's what I mean. Um, so I, I did want to mention this one game because I'd, I've been kind of googling trying to find its name, but uh, I played it years ago. I always thought it was interesting. Um, it's an educational game, uh, but it actually it was a for a while it became sort of a meme on the internet. It's called Real Lives. Basically, it's a life simulation, and um, you are randomly placed somewhere in the world you're born into the world randomly somewhere in the world so uh it's it's essentially trying to teach you that life is unfair mm-hmm. because obviously like statistically speaking you're more likely to be born as like you know in a poor slum in like india than mm-hmm. you are to be born um in like a well-to-do area in the united states is this like so, an online game that's kind of like um, it's not an online game it's 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 a single player okay. experience um but you can get some very interesting stories out of it and you have choice in this game so but things happen to you that a lot of things that are out of your control like for example um if you're if your family isn't born with money you're extreme you're very limited in what you can do this if you're is born sounding a, familiar i think yeah. we might have talked about this at you may have or something at one point um it's it was released in 2001 so it's a game it's it's been out there for a while and mm-hmm. of course i'm sure it is primitive in terms of some of the 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 ai that it has compared to today's standards in fact one of the fun things about it was some of the ridiculous things that could happen to you you know like um, I, I know I distinctly remember where I was so happy that I actually got to live to adulthood because I had this string of experiences where yeah. I was, you know, born in like some slum and in, in a really bad um, poor. I shouldn't say bad, a poor country. And I would consistently die of like malaria or something before I even you know hit adulthood. Mm-hmm. So I finally was able to get, you know, I was born in like Switzerland or something. And so like, yeah, I could finally yes. live to adulthood. <laughs> right. I was actually pretty happy about it. And I did, and then, like, my life still became an absolute mess because I, you know, I, I, I married my, like, high school sweetheart, and I had this great job, and then it turned out, you know, she cheated on me with, like, my boss, and I lost my job, and she, you know, we had a divorce, and then our kid died in a car accident, and it's all these bad things kept happening. It's a I, very nihilistic game. <laughs> I think I ended up killing myself, too, in that one. Uh, like, there's, there's a lot of suicide. You can to do that? No, 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 it just happens. Like, there's just, the game is, is very much a, um, like, you just die, like, you just... Like, okay, um, you've made your choices. Okay, now it's time to advance to the next, like, life milestone. Uh, okay. No, you're dead. And here's why. And it's very, it's, it's, it is not, at, like I said, it's an educational game. Mm. So the fun, <laughs> the fun is derived from how fragile your character, your character is. Um, it's actually, I, I remember I actually went back and downloaded it just to play it again out of curiosity to see what it was like again. Um, probably about two, three months ago. And it is it is still fun for like a few a few hours at least, <laughs> um, because it is primitive compared to some of the things that we have now with with simulations. But the fact that um, it's 
basically the game the cards are stacked against you because there is a clear kind of agenda in this game like you should you should be glad about what you have you know yeah. don't, you, you spoiled spoiled person who's able to play a video game on a computer so so, uh, <laughs> so hashtag woke gym is telling us all to check our privilege I, yes that's i think that's kind of what this game was uh, yeah. i guess ahead of its time um but yeah i did want to kind of mention that game because it, it, i would definitely say that that is an example of emergent uh, emergent gameplay and then forming your own personal story or stories i should say because you will die many many times in this game. i've seen a lot of great um threads online with people sort of telling the story of what happened to their characters in the sims which i know came up briefly earlier <laughs> um and some of them i wonder how much it's embellished or how much is them kind of like adding a little bit of extra flair on top of what actually right. happened but i mean a good chunk of it is like actually like yeah these people got into a fight and burned their house down or something like so that so. one of the more interesting stories and i read this recently um, a sim story where someone decided to he created this large sort of hedge maze in front of the person's house right and um, created it with sort of this kind of concentric circle so he had to keep walking all the way to one side and back around again just to move down slightly and then had to go all the way around so it was in a, in a relatively small area but it would take him several hours to get from his um front door to the street <laughs> so what he did was he in he had the guy had a, the sim had a job and he was in a carpool and at the morning the sim would wake up at like seven o'clock and would get this notification hey your car your, the carpool's arrived so he would step out and try to walk through the maze to get to the get to the car so by the time he got there of course it was long gone <laughs> and uh, it was actually timed so that because of because he, he didn't know that it was gone until he got there so he got there and then he had to walk all the way back again and by the time he got to his front door he walks in the door and like a minute later gets the notification. <laughs> your car, your carpool's arrived. <laughs> That's cruel. Yeah, it was like very, very cruel. But little stories like that yeah. are, and I was never really a Sims fan, but those are the kind of stories that I find interesting about the Sims. And on a, weird things like that. On a more pure sort of gameplay level, I know, Doc, uh, one of your favorite examples is Bioshock and how, oh, yeah. um, like, it's sort of like Breath of the Wild, like we've mentioned, uh, you know, they, these objects have properties and you can basically take advantage of those for certain results. Uh, and Nick, I know last night you were telling me a little bit about Heat Signature and that little um, segment of gameplay that you had. Oh, um, yeah. Do, do you want to share, share, that, share tell that, that story? Yeah, tell that story. So, OK, I had an assassination mission and one of the ways I've been handling assassination missions in Heat Signature is stealing one ship and using that ship's weapons to attack the ship with my assassination target mm. so that I don't even have to enter the enemy ship. I can just fire at it, and it'll blow up, and people will die. Well, basically what happened was that I got into a firefight with the ship because it detected the, my, the ship that I had stolen, mm. and we were uh, fighting, and my ship got to the point where it was um, blown up so bad that I couldn't pilot it anymore. So I, I jump out, uh, out of the ship into my pod, uh, and I try to fly my pod into the other ship because whenever you break a chunk off of a ship, you can actually fly into it from the point that you broke the chunk off. Mm. So I, I, uh, I tried to do that, but I actually ended up getting my pod detected by the ship. So my pod got destroyed. Um, so here I am in a pod that I'm not able to fly anymore, uh, and I just... I have no other way to complete my mission. But what I did was I jumped out of my pod. So it's just me in a spaceship spacesuit flying out in space. I used the recoil on my shotgun to basically shoot myself into the enemy ship. And I just barely managed to make it into there. Uh, so basically you're, you're seeing this image of this guy just like shooting a shotgun to to fly backwards into a into a spaceship that's like half torn apart. Uh, when I get the, to the spaceship, I realize that I'm in a chunk that I can't reach anybody else because the hallways have been broken and destroyed. Hmm. So I use the the item called the Swapper to swap myself with another enemy, uh, make my way over to where my assassination was, which luckily he happened to be on the chunk that I landed in when I when I <laughs> blew up the ship because it flew in a, a million chunks. Uh, not a million, like five. Uh, but I... <laughs> five million chunks. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> when you're dealing with the vacuum of space, any any chunks are a million chunks. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> um, anyway, so I, fl I flew and I make my way, kill the target, uh, and then I'm finally able to 
hijack that ship and fly my way back to my base and complete the mission that way. Uh, so it's like, you know, if I had just gone on to the ship in the first place, that wouldn't have happened. But I think I, I really like the way that, like, the rules of the game set up that sort of scenario for me, even though I was the one doing everything. It's yeah. like, okay, my last recourse is to jump out of my pod and just moonwalk, or not moonwalk, spacewalk over to the ship. Uh, you could be moonwalking at the same time. Yeah, I was, I was moonwalking in my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. The part that I'm leaving out of that story, actually, is that um, the ship, uh, once I killed the assassination target, I wasn't actually able to pilot the ship because I destroyed its thrusters. So I didn't actually complete the mission, but I... You, know. <laughs> you tried. You had yeah. a fun time doing it. I did everything I could, it, like, and, and you got a story out of it. And that's right. kind of, I think, I think what we what, what we've learned, at least for me, that's that's a big takeaway mm-hmm. is uh, emergent gameplay leads to stories. And like Doc was saying, that that water cooler moment. So something that you can talk about if you've all played that same game and you have a shared experience playing the game. Yeah, I think so. But the stories that you get to tell are all personal. Uh, and you see that with all these games that we talked about. I mean, Civ's another great example, too. And people have very different experiences in, in Civ. But because um, as long as you're talking to someone that understands um, the gameplay of Civ and, and, and the type of game that it is, they're going to understand what you're talking about as you, as you share your story. And even with Civ, that's a good example of because the subject matter is very universal. We all understand at least a little bit about history and geography and stuff like that. I could tell somebody a story that I had in Civ in my first playthrough, just in kind of like an historical sense of like, yeah, I went to war with Russia <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was Japan. I was fighting against Russia because we both started off on the uh, South American continent and I could like sort of recount the like you know we had a thousand years basically of off and on wars of russia trying to invade me and then me finally being able to just like when they attacked me once i just wiped out <laughs> several of their cities and essentially bisected russia so that i was controlling most of the continent and russia was in these two little pockets that were sort of split by me we are sick of your crap russia <laughs> <Yeah>. japan <laughs> 2012 um, Civ was great about about it, the newer ones in particular with uh, the way that it handled religion mm-hmm. and just the 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 whole like re- religious conversion factor oh yeah you can see the how they spread great. and yeah, yeah. It was very interesting how it happened. I mean, I had like um, people. Basically, another civilization was sending was aggressively sending me their their like priests. I forget what religion they had, but yeah, they were sending their missionaries over to convert my people to their religion. <laughs> and it was, and they were they were they were basically conquering my they, like they were subver- subverting my people and mm-hmm. like conquering my civilization through religion mm-hmm. and i mean so they could exert control over my people and it was like I, I got to the point where i had to actually kill all of their mercenaries as they came through like they i had to kill them mm-hmm. and i had to start a war with them and mercenaries it was like had, or missionaries 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 both. i had no choice <laughs> I, both, yeah. right both but but i had no choice i'm like i have to do it because they are they were actually going to take me over with with this i mean they were they were they were getting my people to go go along with with their religion that was like a big part of their society and i they, i had people that were basically paying money like to their religion well like it's, they, it's they were all this money and yeah it's because the religions in that game uh if you have enough citizens following that religion you actually get stat bonuses yeah into and, your and, cities. and 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 stat bonuses and like money i think was a big part of it too and it was like i think there's a particular like belief that you can unlock for a religion that literally just makes it so that like if the more uh the more cities of another civilization that have that follow your religion, uh, the more money you get. Yeah. So, like, that's a very invasive right. sort of but thing. I, I do know in that particular game, um, once I wiped out that civilization, and I did, um, oh, yeah. then <laughs> I, I decided to employ their own tactics on other civilizations. And oh, I had did my, you keep their religion? Well, see, I, I actually had my own my own religion that I took back over, and right. then I would take military convoys and escort my missionaries to other places. So that they wouldn't get picked off, mm-hmm. and then take over like just to spread the religion. I could have just taken over the city, but I was having more fun doing that. Yeah. And so I tried that, but they were actually trying to kill me too, like they because they caught on too. They, they they tried to kill my missionaries as well. But right. so I thought. So my whole target there was okay, fine. I'll just send. I'll just have like a military convoy escort my missionary <laughs> to your city. Now yeah. what are you gonna do? <laughs> so because they didn't want to attack them because then that would have started a war. So it was pretty cool. Uh, uh, but that's that's Civ. I mean, you get all these fun stories out of it, and it's it's a different experience every time. And mm-hmm. that's 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 emergent gameplay. I mean, a different experience each time. And you can pick up these games, you can play them. It's going to be different for, for different for you, and um, you know, obviously, some games have it more than others, and and different extent and of course breath of the wild there's still that one storyline going on and you have 
these emergent moments and these you know elements of it that are emergent, then you have a game like Civ, and the whole thing is basically emergent. Yeah. So it just kind of depends, but um, I think we've kind of talked talked through this issue about as much as we can. Doc, do you have any uh, closing closing academic thoughts for us? Well, only this <laughs> um, that I think that this emergent gameplay is really important, mm. um, but we're still working right now on an individual what we would think of as single player experience model and whenever we enter into spaces that are multiplayer it almost instantly reverts back to a more curated experience with less emergent gameplay yeah because we haven't even really even we haven't really touched on mmos um and no No, we haven't and i thought about bringing them up but the more i did i was thinking they're not really good examples for the most part and so i think that there's an important idea term concept academically if you will um which we could talk about in a whole nother topic and that is the interactionist model and there's no good games to really point at for this quite yet um more like simulations i mean uh about a decade or so back some simulations were thrown out there and people sort of crowdsourced and uh they were playing with genetics and and basically they cracked one of the problems with cancer mm. and, and flagged a potential uh, possible future cure for cancer by literally just crowdsourcing the problem. And that's an interactionist's model where everybody sees what everyone else is doing and it moves on procedurally from there within the context of the player generated material. And so that's a whole other thing. And so in the, in the spirit of reckless speculation, I would say that that's where we're going. That's where we're headed. Mm. Uh, Maybe it's 20 years from now. Maybe it's 100 years from now. I don't know. But once we realize that those tools um, can be given to the player to use in a robust, collaborative environment, I think that's the other part of new media that's really going to take. Let's call them video games. Uh, But how about collaborative story? into the next game space. It's whenever those the elements, the vocabulary elements of role-playing, alternate reality games, that kind of a thing, are then sort of flashed over into the video game space in a very different way. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about stuff like Pokemon Go, augmented reality, that kind of a thing, done right. And mm. those those are so in their baby phase right now. They're just They're just not even scratching the surface on what we will hopefully be able to do. And if you want to get kind of weird about it, think in terms of maybe like uh, Ready Player One and that world that's described as being this robust, living, breathing world that kind of like Gary's mod has no rules in terms of how do you beat the game. It's an ongoing interactionist model experience. Um, It's almost like a second life. Almost. And yet, what do we do in, in games like Second Life or Gary's Mod or whatever? We immediately gamify it and we create these smaller spaces wherein we can play games with the tool set. Right. And that's even true of, um, of Minecraft. You know, if you look at some of the, what, what the Minecrafters are doing now, they're having contests in, in Minecraft spaces mm. because the, you know, the, the programming blocks were unlocked and, and open sourced and that sort of thing. So that's my prediction. Well, as usual, we have the the cat crying to let us know that we're out of time for today. (laughs) We were out of time, apparently, since the beginning of this. (laughs) Before we even started. So uh, that's been our show. Um, But if you'd like to support us, um, check us out. We're on Twitter at Backward uh, Compat, at Backward Compat. We are also on Facebook. You can find us back compatible. We are ad free. Um, we don't have a Patreon or anything like that. We do this just out of the uh, the passion that fuels us. Mm. Um, but a uh, way that you can really help the show out quite a bit would be to uh, share us with any friends that you think might be interested. Oh, right. Yes. Um, help us spread the word. Uh, that's kind of our big push right now as we're trying to grow our audience. So um, anything you can do to help us there would be excellent. Um, another thing that would actually help us with being discovered is giving us five star reviews on iTunes. Um, the more five star reviews we get, the higher our 
our uh, ranking in search results. Like, comment, subscribe. <laughs> Basically, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it works, hey. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for episode 111 of the backward-compatible.com podcast, our discussion on emergence in games. And I gotta say, <laughs> 11 one episodes is not nearly enough time to... Uh, never mind. <laughs> I like where you're going with that, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. I'm Nick. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible. Alas, 111 episodes is far too short a time to spend with such excellent and admirable listeners. I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve.